Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about follicular cells and the synthesis of thyroid hormones. So follicular cells are cells of the thyroid. Here we actually have a thyroid. We see that the thyroid is an endocrine organ that actually hugs the trachea, so it's actually in the throat. And the individual cells of the thyroid are called follicular cells, and they're actually going to synthesize thyroid hormones. So let's actually look at one of these follicular cells, so we'll magnify it. Um, the full name is thyroid follicular epithelial cells, but generally people will just call them follicular cells. Now, out over here on the left side, this would kind of be where the blood is, okay? In fact, I should probably mention that. So over here, this region would be where the blood is. And I can actually color that red for us. And then over on this side, this region out here is called either the lumen or the colloid. Um, those are actually each valid terms for this area out here. This is actually the cell itself, the follicular cell, but the follicular cells are arranged in a circle, and so the central part of that is actually the lumen or the colloid. Okay? So let's talk about what the follicular cells do. On a very basic level, they import iodide and they attach it to tyrosine residues on the protein thyroglobulin. And this is going to occur via an enzyme called thyroperoxidase. Um, you'll see it down here written as thyroid peroxidase, although sometimes they'll shorten it to thyroperoxidase. They're the same enzyme. Okay? Um, the thyroperoxidase is actually not um, in the thyroid follicular cell, but it does generate the enzyme and then moves it into the lumen, also called the colloid. And actually the colloid is where that iodine ligation actually occurs. So let's go through the steps. So in your diet, you do need some iodine, and you actually need it in the form of iodide. This is the anionic form of the iodine atom, so it's I minus. So you get that iodide in your blood, and it is transported via active transport into the follicular cell. Okay? Now, the follicular cell, in addition to generating this thyroid peroxidase enzyme, it generates another protein called thyroglobulin. Okay, so this hormone is synthesized in a very strange way. So the follicular cell imports iodide. It then is going to generate a protein through protein synthesis called thyroglobulin. And then it's going to move both of those into the lumen. Okay, it moves the thyroglobulin into the lumen, and then it moves the iodide into the lumen. Now, the iodide has to be activated by the enzyme thyroid peroxidase. Okay. Uh, the actual activation mechanism is beyond the scope of anatomy and physiology. It's got some complicated biochemistry. I talk about it in another video if you want to go see it. But it suffices to say that the enzyme thyroid peroxidase activates the iodide and then attaches it to thyroglobulin. And so we have its iodinated thyroglobulin, and specifically its tyrosine amino acids on thyroglobulin that are iodinated. So remember, there's 20 amino acids. Tyrosine is one of those. And it turns out that tyrosine can be iodinated many times. Okay? If we iodinate, or I should say thyroid peroxidase iodinates a tyrosine once, it's called an MIT, which is monoiodotyrosine. If thyroid peroxidase iodinates it twice, it's diiodotyrosine. And so on the thyroglobulin, there are many tyrosine residues, many tyrosine amino acids. And so we get a lot of MITs and a lot of DITs, okay? but we're not done there. Then there's gonna be a coupling reaction. Forget what that is, but basically thyroid peroxidase is gonna act further and it's gonna iodate those tyrosines even more. Okay? If we get three total iodinations, three of them, then we have what's called T3. And this stands for, I actually have it written here, triiodothyronine. Notice it's not tyrosine, it's thyronine. Triiodothyronine. If we iodinate actually a fourth time, it's called T4, but its actual name is tetraiodothyronine. Tetra meaning four. And the common name for tetraiodothyronine is thyroxine. In fact, if you go to any kind of endocrinology clinic or you know somebody who takes a thyroid hormone as a, as a medication, it's actually labeled as thyroxine or levothyroxine. 
So this is actually the common name for T4. Um, from here on out, I'll probably call them T3 and T4, but just understand what those mean. T3 is iodinated three times, T4 is iodinated four times. And so at this point in the lumen, we actually have a thyroglobulin protein that has lots of T4s and T3s, okay? Um, and we have some leftover MITs and DITs that didn't get um, iodinated three or four times. That's okay. So thyroglobulin will then be imported back into the follicular cell. And once it's back in the follicular cell, there's some proteases, some enzymes that just completely obliterate the protein. They break it into its individual amino acids. Well, the tyrosines, now they're called thyronines, they're amino acids as well on thyroglobulin. So there's going to be some other amino acids that get released, but all of the T4s and the T3s, they get released from the breakdown of this protein. So these are just individual amino acids. In fact, T4 and T3 are just modified amino acids, but they're hormones. They're thyroid hormones collectively, and they're dumped into the blood the general circulation, and they go to their various tissues um, and exert functions. Now, the exact functions we're not going to talk about in this video. That'll actually be a future video where I'll talk about the interplay between TRH, TSH, and the thyroid hormones. But just understand that they're broken down from thyroglobulin and then dumped into the blood. Okay. Now, the MIT and the DIT, the leftovers that didn't get fully iodinated, they are salvaged and recycled. Okay, so we can actually remove the iodines from these and use those in future iodination reactions in the lumen. So we can actually get the iodide back off of those since we didn't get those fully processed to T4 and T3. Okay, so hopefully this process makes sense to you. Now, when T4 and T3 are dumped into the blood, they go to their tissues, right? Now it turns out that T4, that is the thyroxine, is actually not super active. Okay? The most active by far, biologically active form, is our T3, our triiodothyronine. So why in the world would we go to the trouble of synthesizing all this T4? And what this is actually designed to show you right here is that we actually generate more T4s. We generate very little T3 by the thyroid. Why would we do that if T4 is minimally active? Well, T4 actually serves as a pool from which we can make more T3. So T3 will go to a tissue and it will be able to exert its maximal function because it is the most biologically active form. But when you get to a cell that needs thyroid hormone, these cells have an enzyme called a deiodinase, and there's multiple deiodinases, but it suffices to say here that a deiodinase enzyme removes an iodine. So notice here on this right there, in fact I can zoom in a little bit, okay, we have an iodine right here. It's not present over here. So what this enzyme did, this deiodinase, it removed this iodine. And in doing so, it converted T4 or thyroxine into T3. And so this is a process that occurs at the level of the cell that is that needs the thyroid hormone. They can actually themselves convert the T4 back into T3, and then the T3 will have maximal activity. So hopefully that makes sense. And the full name of these deiodinase enzymes are iodothyronine deiodinases. Okay, so this is actually a, a space fill slash ribbon diagram of the enzyme, what it actually looks like. It's kind of cool. Now, when you have these hormones, you don't want them to remain in the blood indefinitely. They have to have some way to be gotten rid of. And so there's alternate deiodinases called type 3 deiodinases that remove other iodines on them and inactivate them. So if type 3 deiodinases act on T3, they remove this iodine and you get something called diiodothyronine. This is inactive, thus the red line through it. If you use the type 3 deiodinase on thyroxine, it removes the same iodine, but it creates something called reverse T3. Notice, molecularly speaking, if you want T3 to be active, the two iodines have to be on this benzene ring, 
and this iodine, the lone one, has to be on the distal one. It's reversed here. There's one iodine on this benzene ring and then two on the distal. This turns out to be not good enough. This is inactive, and it's called reverse T3. These inactive metabolites of the thyroid hormones are then glucuronidated through this enzyme called udp glucuronide glucuronacyl transferase, which transfers a glucuronide residue onto both of these, rendering them soluble, and then they can be transported to the bile and eliminated in the feces. Okay. So that's actually the mode of the thyroid hormone elimination. They're ultimately inactivated through other deiodinase reactions, conjugated to soluble moieties like the glucuronic acid, glucuronides, and then put in bile and eliminated in feces. Okay. So again, this is just a little bit on the elimination of thyroid hormones, but it is important to understand that we mostly generate T4, and only a little T3, but T3 is actually the maximally active or most biologically active form of the thyroid hormone. And then once at the level of the cells that require the thyroid hormone, they can then convert the T4 into T3. Okay? So hopefully this process of thyroid hormone synthesis makes sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.